If this is true, it's only the biggest discovery ever made. So why isn't the public and the media going crazy about the potential discovery of life on Mars? Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. It seems like every single weekend that I say I'm not going to do a video, I end up doing a video. But this was really interesting. A viewer passed it along to me on Twitter, and I took a deeper look, and so I thought it would be worth exploring this whole discovery of fungi on Mars. First, however, a quick aside on the positive, very positive end. Elon Musk has tweeted that there's a good chance that they will actually try to refly serial number 15, the Starship that just landed a few days ago. So that's a pretty cool thing if they decide to do that. I'm super looking forward to it. I may, depending on timing, try to get back down there to see it. I mean, who knows? It could go back up again in a day or it could be one of those things where it sits for weeks and weeks again before it actually takes off. So we'll see what happens, but I would love to get down there to see serial number 15 refly. I kind of have an emotional attachment to it since, you know, that was the one that I saw in person person. So super, super cool. Anyway, to get back to this, I want to talk about this article, but I first want to kind of give you a chance to take a look. So I first want to start with this CNET article, which says, no, NASA photos are not evidence of fungus growing on Mars. Sorry. So the author here goes into a good amount of detail as to why this is not correct, but I like to go back to the source as much as possible. So let's just take a look at what we've got here. So first of all, I want to take a look at the lead author, who is Ron Gabriel Joseph. Uh, interesting person to say the least. <laughs> Let's take a look. He claims to be a professor, but the only thing I can find he's associated with is cosmology.com, which is kind of like, well, okay. Uh, so anyway, he's got this publication, Fungi on Mars, Evidence of Growth and Behavior from Sequential Images. This is published in Advances in Microbiology, which we'll get to in a moment. But he's also got some really kind of funky things here. He's got Quantum Physics of God. So these are his other publications recently. The Time Machine of Consciousness, Quantum Entanglement with the Future, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, look, and there was a Starship 15 behind it. So anyway, he's got a very, very large body of publications, but they are kind of bizarre publications. So let's take that as number one, but let's take a look here and see about the article itself. So here we have Advances in Microbiology, Volume 11 from May of 2021, so obviously just published. Uh, you've got the lead author, of course, Joseph, is cosmology.com, but we do have, you know, Birmingham, University of Birmingham, uh, a Chinese Academy of Sciences, UC San Diego, that's a pretty good school. Um, let's see, we've got uh, something in Egypt, Oklahoma State, George Mason. So we've got some reasonably, you know, <laughs> I, I guess the, the faculty here have some reasonable credentials. So I'll start with that. So that does give it some extra kick. It's a rather interesting, I don't know, <laughs> not sure what to call it, but anyway, uh, let's see if I can actually get this thing to scroll with me here. So it starts off with fungi thrive in radiation intense environments, or maybe it's fungi. I never know how to pronounce that word, so I'm just going to say fungi. Uh, anyway, sequential photos document that fungus-like Martian specimens emerge from the soil and increase in size, including those resembling puffballs. I'm not going to try to say what the scientific name is. After obliteration of spherical specimens by the rover wheels, new sphericals, some with stalks, yeah, we'll take a look at that picture in just a bit, appeared atop the crests of old tracks. Sequences document that thousands of black arctic araniforms, so this is now an analogous thing, so this is talking about arctic um, araniforms, grow up to 300 meters, meters in the spring and disappear by winter. So this is on Earth, this is not on Mars by any means. So anyway, the argument here basically is that, and, and I'll definitely put the link to this in the description so that you can take a look yourself. But the basic argument here is that photographs show something that can only be life. So that's essentially what we got going on here. So let's take a look at the photographs. So we're skipping down to the photos. Again, take a look at this article all you want. I am by no means an exobiology expert. So, you know, again, I'm looking at this very much as a layman. But anyway, here is, these are some satellite images, which I find very unconvincing because there's a whole bunch of different possibilities for what could be causing that. So the more interesting stuff here is when we get down to the close-up things. So here we've got a picture from Sol 1143 and then another one from seven souls later, which is 26 hours, is that right? I think Martian days are just a little bit longer. Was it 24 and a half? It's, it's very close. I think it's 26 months and 24 and a half hours. So anyway, a Martian soul is close to a, a, an Earth day. So it's seven days later, seven souls later. 
And so the evidence here that he gives, which again is not the most clear, you know, yeah, it's a photograph. Yeah, it is interesting that there was a blank spot and now there's a whole bunch of stuff in it. But, you know, there's wind. The Martian atmosphere is not that thick, but there is wind. Here's another image from Sol 1145 and 1148. And you've got these spherical things. Unfortunately, the resolution of the two images is very, very different. But uh, you've got some highly spherical objects. I guess this is our sort of the, the part of the photograph that we're able to associate with each other and up here. So this is the registration, I guess. And so the in-between parts in here are the evidence, again, of life on Mars. And then we've got closer up stuff, and here we have stalks. And so this is a stalk, and that's a potential stalk, and that's a potential stalk, and that is, I don't know, I guess a potential stalk, <laughs> etc. So anyway, so these are some of the photographs here. So let's just think about this for a moment. So let's back up to this particular photo, which, you know, again, supposedly is evidence. So if you look at this, you can see that there is also a lot of fine granulated soil or dust or something like that. And again, Mars's atmosphere is only 1% one, 1 as thick as Earth's atmosphere, but 1% still has enough force to move things around. There's massive Martian dust storms that occur, and they can, of course, and historically have covered up the uh, different rovers and the different landers, the Martian landers, that have solar panels. One of the reasons NASA has gone with nuclear energy sources on their new rovers is that the older ones that had solar panels would get covered up by dust. And so, you know, the Martian dust storms and things would blow dust and it would settle on the solar panels, which would reduce their efficiency by a lot. And it's not like you can get a guy out there with a little squeegee and like clean it off because it's on Mars. So anyway, there is definitely a motivating force, like dust can be moved around on Mars. And, and so you have this image, right, which clearly shows these spherical objects. You also have this image seven days later, or seven souls, uh, sorry, this is only three souls later. But anyway, what's not obvious here is whether or not the, there was a wind, right? So if there had been wind, there is a really relatively good chance that a lot of these could have been uncovered by wind or even the larger objects could potentially have been blown by wind. Now, yes, there are biological possibilities, of course. On Earth, I would say like, yeah, that could be a mushroom perhaps. Uh, <laughs> but on Mars, I think we have to go for the more obvious answer or the one that is the least complicated, which is that it's very likely that some form of wind has blown things around. Now, the argument against that is why would these particular rocks here, if these are rocks, have stayed in place while these have moved around? That's an interesting thing. Uh, there are ones like I believe, and well, this one maybe has gotten bigger, so it could have been uncovered. I don't know. It's possible. But it, it is interesting that there are a lot of these objects that have not moved, and yet there are ones that have moved. But the argu one of the arguments in the paper is that these things have gotten bigger. So like this one has grown into this one, and this one has grown into this one. But again, if you look at these images, if there has been wind, just that could have been uncovered, right? So it's gotten bigger. The interesting part would be if there were things that had disappeared, but mostly this is just things that have appeared. So anyway, so, you know, <laughs> it's some evidence. This one is really tenuous. I mean, if you start looking at this stuff up close, that you can see that there's these kind of layers of kind of rock underneath the dust, and there's no evidence that this is a stem rather than just a piece of rock underneath here. So the, the likelihood, especially <clears throat> you can see the wind patterns here. They, there's a, a windward side here that's blown up a, a mini dune, and then there's a leeward side. And on the leeward side of this is where all of these have appeared, right? So the wind has blown this up and created a little teeny mini dune. And then you've got the leeward side where the wind has sort of blown away the dust, but hasn't filled it back in again. So the odds are very, very high that it's something along these lines. And again, you know, the problem with these kinds of papers is a lot of times they're like, oh, it can't be that, it must be this. And, and that's just not a viable argument. But anyway, it's quite evidence that there's been wind on this area. So that's the, you know, that's the evidence of what has been going on. I find it fairly tenuous at best. I mean, this is a pretty reasonable one. And if we go back to, the, to this one, that's, you know, that's interesting that there's a lot. But again... I would have to, I'm, I haven't done this myself, but one would have to count and see if there are ones that have disappeared 
in the meantime also because right one of the things about life is especially a fungi if it's like a puff ball it gets bigger and bigger and then it explodes because it spores so that would be interesting and it's very very difficult to see if there are any that have disappeared it would have been nice to have had something a little closer up there's a kind of registration one that's a blue ball over here a blue thing and the, the rest of these are kind of white so again odds are that that has all been dust Again, odds are on this that we have a lot of dust images. <clears throat> These are all, again, very far away, so the argument for biology is tough. Now, there has been evidence, right? There's been, um, is it ethane or methane? Methane, I believe. There's been evidence on Mars of methane that has seasonally appeared and disappeared, and that is potentially produced by life, but it's also potentially produced by non-biological factors. Here again, we've got things that, yeah, they could be life, but, uh, you know, they, they, the odds are that they are not life. So the odds, again, I would say are that this is not life. This is, you know, this is something that's being produced by non-biological processes. But let's take just a quick moment and think to ourselves, okay, what if this actually is life? What if this is fungi on Mars? Well, that is earth shattering if it is, right? Because the, uh, the odds would be super, super high that if we discovered something on Mars, it would be unicellular like bacteria or even viruses or something. Very, very low level, simple life. A fungus is an incredibly complex version of life any evidence, I mean, they are extremophiles, but the evidence that they would be able to grow in an environment that had high radiation and basically no atmosphere, so almost a vacuum, is incredibly, you've got to reach a pretty high bar to get to that point. It would be amazing, though, if there was multicellular life on another planet. I honestly think there would be more evidence in that case that life was a, a version of panspermia in that case, right? If it did happen that either something from Mars blew away and ended up on Earth, or that something on Earth, like like a piece of chunk of something, right, when when an uh, asteroid or something hit the Earth, that a piece flew off of Earth, orbited around for a while, and landed on Mars. And of course, we would have to wait until we had DNA records. You know, we'd have to go scoop these things up, and we'd have to sample the DNA. DNA and we'd have to figure either bring it back to Earth or have some sort of laboratory on Mars that we were able to do that on. And I have a feeling if that was the case that we would discover that the DNA actually has a match between Earth-bound life forms and Martian life forms because it would be incredibly unlikely to have multicellular life anywhere else. The, the creation of life, interestingly enough, doesn't seem nearly as hard as the creation of multicellular life like us and fungi and everything. Uh, because basically in order to do that, you have to have a, a bacteria that has eaten another bacteria or a virus or something like that and has sort of become a multi component cell. So that is an incredibly unlikely event, so it would be much, much more likely that unicellular life would be on Mars if it had developed completely independently of Earth. In any case, of course, this would be an incredibly massive discovery if it was actually proved to be true. I don't know how they're going to find evidence in the near future that will either back this up or disprove it. Of course, a lot of people have talked about how the Viking lander potentially discovered life on Mars, and a lot of people have talked about how in the 1990s when they discovered an asteroid that was from Mars that had little potential, like, you know, wormy kind of holes in it and stuff, that that was evidence of life on Mars. There have been tantalizing evidence, and like I said, the methane that appears and disappears in the Martian atmosphere. So there has been tantalizing evidence that there could be active life on Mars. The odds are very, very high that if there was life on Mars, and I personally actually think there probably was life on Mars, that it has disappeared a long time ago. But, uh, you know, extremophiles under the surface of the soil could potentially they could actually be producing life currently. As far as multicellular complex life on the surface itself, that seems incredibly unlikely. So I would say until there's a lot more evidence of this that I'm not going to believe there's mushrooms on Mars, especially given the track record of the lead author. He's kind of an out there kind of, you know, scientist. And I don't like the fact that he lists himself as a professor but works on cosmology.com. I'm like, eh, you know. <laughs> so that, again, a little bit of like self-promotion and everything. And Advances in Microbiology is a bit of an iffy publication. So again, there's a lot of things against this circumstantially, 
but it, you know, let's take let's take a wait and see attitude. Certainly, with perseverance on the surface, it actually has some ability to detect biological markers in the soil, in rocks, etc. So, if there is something and it's as widespread as the authors are claiming here, then there should be evidence of this that we will get from perseverance, and so that should actually help to either establish this or dissuade us from believing that this is the case. But anyway, really fascinating article. It was, you know, it was kind of cool to look into it and kind of go like with a critical eye, say like, mm, <laughs> unlikely to be true. But it's very cool if even the possibility exists. So I think that's neat to think about. But don't get your hopes up right now. I really doubt that it's the case. But it is a really cool and interesting article and it's got some interesting tantalizing images that are along with it. So there you go. Alrighty, I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it fun and informative and interesting. And again, don't blame me, I'm just the messenger here. But if you did like it, definitely like and subscribe. And also definitely check out, there it is, <laughs> Dr. Know-It-All Knows on Patreon.com to join us because we have a wonderful group of patrons and I really appreciate their support. And of course, don't forget about the merch store. We have Don't Mess With Tesla and a whole bunch of other t-shirts and stuff, so definitely take a look at that. Also, don't forget about Weeble because we are now affiliated with Weeble. All this stuff is in the description, so you can just check the links if you you're interested. And of course, don't forget we are also Tesla and Amazon affiliates, and that's also in the description. In the meantime, please do feel free to ask me questions in the comments, and remember, keep them generally nice. I'm just the messenger again here. I did not come up with this article, but certainly definitely let me know what you think in the comments. And if you're really interested, you can definitely email me at drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.